This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome aboard your live safari of today. We are sitting here on this extremely chilly, chilly morning with Princess Klalamba, a young leopardess who looks like she's about to pounce at any moment. This is, of course, wild wonderland. She is hunting. Not sure what it is yet, but we're just going to check it out and see if she's going to catch something. It's very early in the morning here. Look at her. She's gonna pounce. She pounced. Okay. I think we're gonna try and move forward. I have no idea what it was she went for there. Oh, she didn't get it. She didn't get it. She's on the move. Look at that. Oh, she missed. This is not uncommon for leopards to miss, but she really did try. This is, of course, Wild Wonderland. This is absolutely magnificent. This is happening, folks. This is 100% live. Here we are. We're watching the migration story unfold. Here's a lion. There's a lion right next to us. Oh, that was close. You can't possibly script something like this. Good morning and welcome back to CGTN's Wild Wonderland live show. My name is James Hendry. On camera we have got enormous James. There is his enormous fingers. And we are sitting right here at the North Clan Den. And it's a great hive of activity. There are currently three hyenas under the car, believe it or not. We're coming to you live from three locations on this magnificent continent. The Masai Mara here in Kenya, the Serengeti in Tanzania, a little bit to the south of us, and way south of that, the Western Kruger of the great Kruger National Park, where you've just been watching Klalamba on the hunt. Now, this rather wonderful group of hyenas has some spectacular dynamics that have been studied for more than 20 years now by various research organizations and we're going to unpack some of those dynamics for you today. Please do talk to us using the hashtag CGTNWild or the hashtag Wild Wonderland. that's on Twitter, hashtag CGTNWild or hashtag Wild Wonderland. Right now these hyenas are waiting for the migration herds to arrive up here in the north. They're a formidable hunting and scavenging force, and very soon those migrating herds are going to thunder on here. We're going to talk now about the migration, but before we do that, let's go down to Steve, where in fact that migration is being hunted. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the middle of the migration here in the Mara Triangle, where, as you can see, there is a very large herd of wildebeest moving away from one lioness who's just gone flat in the grass somewhere nearby. This is the time of year. This is a splendid time of year. Lions, wildebeest, zebra, it is a photographic experience. Good morning, everybody. My name is Steve Falkenbridge, joined by jean dre Gerding on camera. And like I said, we are amongst the herds in the open, red oat grass fields of the Mara Triangle. The second lioness is up. We were with one of the lionesses before who looked quite interested in hunting. Although now that we've seen them close up, their bellies are quite full, but they can't help themselves when there is this multitude of game around. They just want to catch and catch and catch. So while we wait for these two lionesses to get closer to the herds, we are in the migration. So let's learn a little bit more about it. The red oat grass plains of the Mara Serengeti sway in anticipation. In February, around 400,000 wildebeest are born on the short grass of the Serengeti's southern plains. Just half an hour, the calves have found their feet. And one of nature's greatest journeys begins. From the southern plains, more than a million animals move northwest into the Serengeti's western corridor, massing on the banks of the Grumeti River. 
As the rut ends, the herds gallop north once more. Eventually, two million grazers arrive to feast on the abundance of the Maasai Mara. It begins with the trickle of the zebra vanguard, enjoying the undisturbed long grass plains, making the first crossings of the turbulent Mara River. Many fall to the rapids and the crocodiles. And then comes the main body of the migration, the thundering herds of white-bearded Gnu, leading songs of chaos in search of green pasture. The herds know the danger, but the call for food is too great. All must take the plunge. Not all will make it. For those that do, hungry prides and clans patrol the banks. For survivors, rich red oat grass is the reward. Before it's time to cross the river again, as nature's greatest herd follows the life-giving storms and verdant plains of the Mara Serengeti for nourishment. Welcome back, and if you are just joining us, you are watching CGTN Wild Wonderland live show. And we are bringing you these pictures live from the Mara Triangle in Kenya. And I think what's actually happening, these two lioness are just walking straight through the herd. They've split them in two, and they're headed directly towards where James, my colleague, had the pride last night with the cubs feeding on a wildebeest. We were on our way there this morning to follow up. And this lioness rudely interrupted us and made us delay a little bit. I'm only joking, it wasn't rude. It's fantastic to spend time with lions hunting. You see their intention, they can't help themselves. They're not being very stealthy. But um, this time of year, the animals get very sort of un... Well, they don't become very vigilant because they think someone else is watching. So quite often you can actually see the lions run straight into a herd and catch one because of the confusion. Some will run and others don't quite know why they ran. And quite often the lionesses will capitalize on that. Quite often in these situations you can have multiple kills with lone lionesses on individual wildebeest or zebra. But that herd is giving them no chance. We see you. And that flight distance that they've got is very good. <laughs> Beck, you'll settle for some carnage as the lionesses hunt. Well, that could be the case. It could be the case if the lions get their energy up and they get unleashed into that herd there. We could see some carnage. But uh, they're not showing too much stealth. They're just going, okay, wildebeest, do you want some of this? <laughs> they're walking straight at them. <laughs> They've veered off a little bit from where they were headed, where we thought maybe the kill was. Maybe they're trying to find it again. But Tristan is down in the Serengeti, not far away, and he's got a beautiful bird of prey. Indeed we do, Steve, and I'm sure the migration herds in the background are far happier that it's a bird of prey watching them than the lions that you have on your side. You can see it's a pale chanting goshawk that's sitting pretty on a rock at the moment, and it's like us watching the migration as they roam around and graze in the early morning sunshine. Now, my name is Tristan, and on camera I have got David, and it is a very, very, very big welcome to the Serengeti, as Steve mentioned. We're in Tanzania, and it is a beautiful morning here. We're just around the rocky areas at the moment, and we've been looking for a leopard this morning, but it's been a little bit elusive. We saw some fresh footprints for a leopard and some fresh dung, but so far we haven't been able to find it, and we were hoping with the migration in town, the leopards will actually take advantage of that, and they will go after the small young 
wildebeest and sometimes you can get lucky and find them on a wildebeest kill but in the meantime we managed to spot this beautiful beautiful bird and you'll find these pale chanting goshawks they often sit like this on the rocks and they'll wait until it gets a little bit warmer and as soon as they've warmed up a bit then up and off they go in search of all kinds of different food items obviously they're not really feeding too much off the migration except that what happens when the migration is in town is the grass gets much shorter and it exposes prey for birds like this. These guys will be hunting a lot of small rodents um, and since the migration has been in town and then the, the grass has gotten so much shorter, it's actually much easier to spot rodents in these areas. And in fact, in the last couple of days, I've seen quite a few running through the grass and it'll make life for these birds of prey much easier. So it just goes to show that even though the migration and we, we see it and we think of all the animals that depend on it are big animals, there's actually small animals like these guys that also depend on those herds in the background in order to find food. Now talking about hunting and food, it sounds like Columba is still on the hunt, so let's send you back down to Lauren in South Africa. Princess Columba is still on the hunt. She's stalking. Look at this. Look how slowly she's moving her body here. So agile, yet so smooth and silently through the thicket. Now, I have no idea what it is she's after. I imagine it'll be something like a scrub here, but I can't see anything. She's right in the thicket here after something. I'm just going to go a little bit closer. <sighs> now she's right, ah, she's there, she's there. She's at making a dash for something. Let me just get another bit closer. There we go. Can you see her, Seb? She's gone into a drainage line, which makes it a little bit tricky to follow her, but hopefully she catches something, and then we will be able to keep up with her. Alrighty. She caught a scrub here yesterday. She's very good at catching the scrub hairs. Let's just see if we can get any sort of view for, of her for you. There you go. Can you see her? Yeah. Okay. She's up the other side of the embankment. She's listening intently. She must be hungry. It's a very, very cold day today. 11 degrees Celsius and I think 51 degrees Fahrenheit is chilly. And if she didn't feed during the night, she's gonna be ravenous. Of course, her hearing is far better than our hearing. Carol seemed hungry this morning, yes. Clalamba and myself, of course. <laughs> it's cold. But it's perfect for her for really to, to listen really, really carefully. She'll hear the scrub hairs and things like that moving through the thickets more so than we even would. And although leopards prefer to hunt bigger animals, they can subsidize on smaller prey. And we saw Columba catch a scrub here yesterday. So if she hasn't eaten since then, and of course we cannot confirm that, then she's very hungry. Come on, Columba, go get your breakfast, girl. Now, of course, it takes a lot of energy for leopards to hunt. They've got to get it precise. They're ambush hunters. So they've got to get the timing perfectly right, or of course they will fear. And it would be a waste of energy for them. I really can't see what it is she's actually looking at. Yes, many of you have noticed on the sort of right side of her neck, it's stained a bit pink. It'll be from something she was eating. It will be blood, but I don't think it's a wound on her. It's most likely from whatever she has been eating, and she's just not been able to clean it properly. So it's a little bit stained pink. So well spotted, everyone. Spotted. <laughs> she's really, really, really focused. Oh, oh she's 
goes. She's so, so flexible. She can just maneuver her body under branches, through thickets. And look, she's completely gone from our view. You just see the spots there. That's how well camouflaged leopards really are. I just wish I could see what she's looking at. Okay, let me see if I can just go back a little bit and we can get a slightly better view of her. Okay, we're gonna try and get a little bit of a better view of her for you. And while we do that, up to James and his hyenas. There's a huge hive of activity here at the North Clan Den. Now, just to give you a bit of background, this clan is about 77 individuals strong. Not all of them will hang around at the den here. We do have some very readily identifiable members of this den, though, and I'm just going to ask James to look at this one very closest to us now, just over here. <laughs> that is one of the youngest members, and her name is Ravi, which means spring in Hebrew, if I'm not mistaken. And she has a sister or a brother, I'm not sure which, called Aviv, which is also means spring uh, in Hebrew. The other one is Arabic. Then the other most recognizable one is just lying in a puddle of hyenas over there. And this is the inimitable Waffles. Now Waffles is the one on the left-hand side of your picture there. She's got a collar around her neck and she was the matriarch of this clan for a very long time. And we'll just go off her now because obviously she's fast asleep while I tell you her story and we'll watch some of the others having a bit of a play there. Waffles, unusually for a hyena, rose from the ranks, at least from a very low-ranking hyena, to take over the matriarchy. Now, that's a very unusual situation. Normally, it's the daughter of the matriarch that takes over. And so she took over from a very low-ranking individual and has now been replaced because she's got a bit old and she's been replaced by her granddaughter soup who doesn't appear to be here right now now what we have here is a little puddle of hyenas and the darkest one amongst them her name is or his name is mutt and he's one of the funniest little things he'll come and he'll climb under the car and he'll try and pick bits off it they're just most amusing to be around in fact i think that's him there i think that's mutt coming under the car Right, well, there's the puddle of waffles. Let's go and learn a little bit more about her history and, in fact, those two cubs that she's with now. Until recently, the North Clan's old matriarch had no direct heir, having lost all of her previous daughters. But with her latest litter of two, Waffles perhaps had a chance to extend her leadership lineage. Despite her age, she remained a dominant and fiercely protective mother. Hyena cubs assume their mother's status. If one of these cubs was female, Waffles may have been able to raise her to take the matriarchy. Alas, it was not to be. Waffles was challenged by her granddaughter Soup and she lost. Waffles' new litter will have to fight for the matriarchy if they want it, just as their mother did so many years ago. Well, I'm very sure that this little pride of lions is very happy that the North Clan is not in town because it's making their life a lot easier as they devour a wildebeest that they must have caught in the early hours of this morning. It seems like a lioness and four of her cubs that are fairly young still. We actually saw these the other afternoon on a rock together and they were kind of bouncing around all over the place, but they've managed to secure themselves a really nice kill. Now, talking about hyenas and lions, it's been very really interesting to, to watch the dynamic here in comparison to the Masai Mara. 
Here in this part of the Serengeti, the hyena numbers are not very high at all. There's not huge amounts of hyenas here, which means that this is actually the first time in three weeks that we've seen lions feeding on a kill that's still got meat on it. Um, generally, what happens with the lions is that they actually hunt at night. And so what they do is they'll kill at night and they'll eat, and it's not a problem. In the Mara, the hyena numbers are so high that at night they lose a lot of their kills. And so you see a lot of active hunting during the day from the lions there, as opposed to what you see here. Here, most of the day, the lions spend sleeping, and at night is when they'll then start to go and hunt all of these herds and be able to feed. And they don't actually have to worry too much because the hyena numbers are not so big, and really they don't actually get to or have to fight for their food nearly as much as what you'll see um, in the Mara. But the four youngsters are having a good feed. It looks like that there is um, two males at least and one female with a little funny ear. So we'll sit here with these guys and watch what they get up to. In the meantime though, let's send you across to David who's got hyenas on a carcass of their own. Jumbo Jumbo, and it's very true, hyenas have been known to be very good thieves, especially when they gang up in big numbers to steal food from lions. Now, these are spotted hyenas, just like what uh, James had. And um, at a very earth and on camera is Bungay. It's a very warm welcome to all of you to this very special setting of watching this cleanup crew who are just cleaning this particular environment of where we are. Talking of scavenging, I do not know where our ecosystem would be. Lauren, very good question. And you're asking, do the hyena scavenge more during migration? I would say no. Apparently, Lauren, what happens during migration, there's a lot of fresh kill. They don't need to scavenge or they don't need to eat what is dead. They tend even to hunt for themselves. Now, their hunting habit is a bit different from the lions or cheetahs or leopards. What they'll do is to just come, close in on the herds, and they look for any slow one, any that could be limping, or just try and zero in on a calf, on a young one. That's what they do. And once the migration is gone, they know it'll be difficult now to get that kind of fresh food, they'll start scavenging. So I'll say, Lauren, during the migration, they scavenge less. This kill I saw it three days ago. It was a young wildebeest, as you can see on the ribs there. And that's what now they're trying just to clean. But from where we are, the wildebeest are barely 50 meters away. And Bunge is going to show you, like 60 meters from where we are, 60 yards odd. See them there? I can just hear nye, nye, nye. These hyenas are definitely having a wonderful time with all the migration around. We'll stick around and find out because my big plan today is to look for more to look for some lions. Let's go to steal the lions which are on the move. More lions. Well, lions are abounding this morning. And if you're just joining us, you are watching CGTN Wild Wonderland live show. We are just tracking next to these lionesses as they've looped all the way around that herd. And they were also uh, had a little time for a drink. Uh, they haven't stopped moving, had a quick drink, and then they continued on. I don't know what their plan is, but they might be heading back to Egyptian Goose Pan. Maybe the rest of the pride is there. Maybe the cubs are there. But they're not showing that much interest in the, the herds themselves. I'm just going to stop here, pull up behind this termite mound. There we go. Now they stopped for us beautifully. Hello, Tracy. You want to know how long the migration takes? Well, it sort of starts kicking off um, up here early, as early about June and then slowly starts heading back in October. But that doesn't mean that that is the migration. That is the migration in the Mara. Um, the migration is a constant cycle as they move from the plains of the Serengeti, sort of they have their youngsters in about January time. Uh, then they start moving and following the rains, getting up here for this enormous bountiful grasslands, um, mowing it down short and then moving south again. So it's a big circle. 
And it's not a straight line either because the animals are moving left and right, up and down, all over the place. And, well, there's no animal that moves up and down more than the Princess Tlalumba. Indeed, the princess is moving. She's way up ahead of us now, I'm afraid. And we are in the trickiest position to maneuver. She's taken us up and around everywhere. She's <laughs> going to have to maneuver this car a little bit better, I'm afraid. She's desperately hungry and checking out every avenue for a potential meal. Oh, crikey, this is going to take us a little while to navigate out of these ditches. I think I'm going to go this way. So why don't we try and catch up with her? Hopefully we get there. We send you guys back up to the Maasai Mara. So we're still at the den here and things are just settling down a little bit as the day warms up. They'll have a little bit of a play and then probably settle down for a sleep. And just before we look at the one you're looking at now, can we go, James, to those ones over there? The little pile, you can hardly see them. I just want to point out that those are the two cubs that you saw with waffles there, Grenadine and Ilovo. And unfortunately for them, because their mother has de been deposed, they are now sort of third and fourth or fifth ranking in the hierarchy of this clan. There we are. That's Waffles there. Uh, Janine, no, a male hyena couldn't ever lead a clan. That is impossible because, of course, they are subordinate to the females, universally subordinate to the females. Please excuse our shadows there. There's nowhere else for us to park, I'm afraid, though. There is young Ravi. They are the youngest ones here, and their mother Jude is lying around here somewhere. Uh, the males are smaller than the females. They are actually, they have fewer or uh, a less concentrated amount of male sex hormone than the females do. It's a slightly different hormone. It's not testosterone, but it's a slightly different concentration of androgens that make the females much more aggressive and much more prone to aggression than the males. Do you just listen to that noise? That's one of Waffles' cubs calling there. And there's been a bit of a fight. Now, this is quite interesting. This is begging. They're begging to try and suckle from her, even though they are more than a year old now, or just about a year old. And hyenas will sometimes suckle their cubs for up to 18 months. Isn't that an unbelievable sound? So that's Waffles now. You can see she's up. She's still quite dominant. She's flicked her tail up. That's a sign of dominance. She's chasing off the one to the left. I don't know who that is. And you can very clearly see that she's still dominant over the one that's, still, that's just come in. Now she's disciplining her cubs, one of which seems to be bullying the other. So you can see, although Waffles is obviously very old, you can see that she's got matted fur. She's got a lot of injuries. She's still pretty high up the hierarchy. Now, I always like to compare the matriarch of the other female, the other female dominated society out here. That is the elephants. And the matriarch's role is very different Remember that the matriarch here is not a teacher, she's a dominator. Whereas in the elephant herds, she is much more a leader and teacher. Beautiful. Now that noise that you heard is called squittering, and it's not an uncommon sound, and it's often made by hyenas who are begging, desperate for some kind of motherly attention. In every spotted hyena litter, one cub is dominant over the other. A 
high-ranking mother brings some rotting breakfast back to the den for two cubs. Siblings they may be, but share they would not. The larger, more dominant cub took the lot, leaving her sister with nothing. The deprivation resulted in this horrific begging whine, called squittering. Hyenas suckle for up to a year, so the wretched cub, around seven months old, sought her mother's milk, while the dominant sister devoured the meat. Mum showed little maternal patience, snapping at her whining daughter. The hungry, squittering little hyena could do nothing but watch in a furious tantrum as the breakfast carcass disappeared. You are live again with us in the Mara Triangle with our two lioness. And they were lying down having a bit of a breather. And one lone wildebeest came charging towards them, all confused and on its own. And I've got both the lionesses going. But if you've ever tried to play that game with your cat, just put your hand in front of your cat and just move it from side to side vigorously. They can't help themselves. They have to catch it. And this lioness, she saw an animal coming and she got very excited, although you can see her belly is rather round. So that's not food that drives them, it's instinct. Look how pretty she looks on top of that termite mound. You're blending in beautifully there, girl, and giving us some wonderful shots. Well, once again, everybody, we're going to send you back down to South Africa with Lauren and the little princess. We caught up with our princess here, and she is still stalking. She's so carefully, considerately moving every single leg. She's keeping her body very low to the ground and she keeps popping her head up, listening, assessing the situation. And once again, my meager human eyes cannot see anything that she could potentially be looking at. She's gonna go right in front of the vehicle. Now, I forgot last time, but I am Lauren and I do have Seb on camera. I got caught up in all the excitement of our little princess here. Look at that, look at the way she's moving her legs. She's so dainty and petite. Look at that back leg coming to join. Now she's registering her back leg is going into the exact same position that that front leg has been. It's a very clever way of moving, and we call this registering. She's so much more delicate than the male leopards we have out here. Now she's just moving in front of the vehicle. So I'm trying to be as silent as possible. Rainbow D is asking what is the largest prey that Tlalamba here could take down. She's actually even been known to take down Steenbok's Diker, Young Impala. Um, she's, I see her regularly catch scrub hares. That's quite an easy meal for her to catch. She's a bit of a scrub hare expert. And of course she can eat that quickly and it will provide her with lots of energy and sustenance. But Tlalamba here has been known to take down much bigger animals. She is smaller than the males, as I mentioned, but she's still got power. Look at her, look how low her body is to the ground. So she surprises prey, but she's still a predator. She's still accomplished. And we have seen Tlalamba here eat many, many different animals. But I have a funny feeling, I could be wrong, at the minute she's after a scrub here. But she definitely can take down mammals much bigger than that. But for leopards, they're solitary. So they're out here on their own. They can't risk injury. They can't risk putting themselves in any position where they'll get hurt or some sort of wound or infection, which would mean they wouldn't be able to hunt anymore. 
So all leopards, not just Kalamba here, have to be very, very careful when launching their attack and exactly which animal they choose to attack. If they get it wrong, it could be a fatal decision for them. Whereas lions, they hunt cooperatively in prides and coalitions. So they've got each other to take down prey. Leopards only have themselves. Look at her go. She sees something. I really hope we can see her catch her breakfast this morning. <laughs> She's carefully moving with every single muscle fiber. And look at her tail, watch her tail. She's also carefully moving her tail. She's sneaking up on something right now. I just don't know exactly what it is. Sana's saying that walk is incredible. I totally agree. She's an incredible leopardess. I love this girl. It's not out, it's not easy being out here alone in the wilderness. And she survived. And she's good at remain hidden. We don't always see Tlalamba. But I'm so happy that we can share this with you live on CGTN Wild. Some things there, I just can't put my finger on what it is. So you see how her back is arched like that? She's gonna pass. Oh, I don't think she caught it. Oh girl, you're trying so hard. So that back arch was her getting ready to pounce. Okay, we're going to keep up with her and fingers crossed she gets her breakfast because she's hungry. So while we do that, you guys are going all the way up north to the Serengeti. Indeed, and I always have to laugh at little Tlalama because she does pounce and jump and stalk all kinds of things that are a mystery to us often and so maybe it was a little gerbil or a scrub here or something that got away from her. Luckily though for these young lions is that unlike Clalumba who's having to work very hard to find food and to survive, these guys are still dependent on mom and I'm almost 90% sure that mom is the one that managed to bring this down. She would have successfully hunted this wildebeest on her own which just gives you goes to show and gives testament to how successful lions can be and, and how good they are as being mothers. To be a single lioness in an area like this that's predator rich and to raise cubs is really not very easy, especially in a place where they rely so heavily on the migration. You must remember when the migration's not here, there really isn't as many lions at all. I mean, um, as much food around for these lions and it makes it a lot harder for these guys to be able to actually feed and to be able to find the food that they need and so it's why the prides in this particular section are quite small um, you don't get massive large prides like some other parts of the Serengeti um, but it would have been much easier for these guys now during this time of the year and, and this lioness will be taking full advantage particularly because her cubs are growing um, all four of these cubs are obviously getting much larger and, and of the four three of them are actually boys which means that you know that's a lot of miles to feed and and as these boys are growing so they're going to need a lot more food than what they have obviously previously and so she's going to be working very hard to to feed them but you can actually see the size difference now between the the male and the female there you can see that the male on the left how much bulkier he is than the the little female on the right even though they're the same age you can already see his head is getting much larger 
than hers and even his shoulders and his kind of um, hip areas are much bigger. Anyway, these guys are still eating away and uh, filling those tummies. And so while we watch them do that, let's send you across to Steve with his lions who are still looking for breakfast. We are going through bouts of eating, lions sleeping or trying to hunt. And well, if you are only joining us, this is Wild Wonderland live show brought to you only by CGTN. And we are coming to you live from the Mara Triangle in Kenya, where there are two members of the Salt Lake Pride. There are more members somewhere around here. We're not 100% sure where, um, but we do believe probably a little bit further towards the south. But we are worried to leave these two because they are quite keen to maybe catch something, although the herd is giving them a very wide berth. This lioness is doing as much as she possibly can to blend in with that termite mound. Benjamin, you want to know if males or females hunt well? Well, they both hunt very, very efficiently. And um, male lions are actually very good hunters. Uh, quite often what happens is when they turn the age of three or so, they get pushed away from the pride and they become nomads. And sometimes on their own, sometimes in small coalitions, they need to be able to provide for themselves. They need to be able to get big and strong. Um, and the reason why everyone thinks lionesses are more efficient hunters than males Oh, sorry, more during the migration. So I do apologize, but uh, during the migration, we haven't really even seen any males apart from the one yesterday, but both females and males will just smash animals as they come. Uh, most of the time, the males will move in and just clear females off of the kill. And the problem is, is that there are normally more females in a pride with males hanging about. So statistically, we see more females making kills than males. But males are very, very good hunters, very efficient hunters, and they are quite necessary in pulling down much larger prey. So out of the migration, without males, buffalo are almost unavailable to prides of lion because they need the weight of the male lions to pull them down. Well, James is having a wonderful morning with the North clan. Let's go and see what those little critters are up to. We're still having a great time here and I'm amazed that they haven't gone to sleep because things have got quite warm. And I must just tell you that the smell here at the hyena den is not the nicest thing in the world. It's not the best smell you'll have in the Mara. It's like a sort of wet, dirty, and slightly carcass-smelling dog is what it smells like out here. My name is James Hendry. On camera, of course, we have got enormous James. Let's go over to Waffles who's now looking at us with a face that, uh, well, possibly only a mother could love because she is a battered old girl. But she has done very well to survive as long as she has and to ascend to the matriarchy. She's covered in mud. She's got scars all over her back and uh, now she's insulted. And so she's going to walk away from her squittering youngsters. I don't know who the other youngster that's been hanging around her is, but it's obviously a fairly high ranking one go back to those ones there. There they are. One of them is her daughter and the other is not. That's one of the daughters and that's the one that's been squittering. Now, as I say, they will suckle for up to 18 months, but you can see that Waffles is not interested in suckling her youngsters anymore. Anyway, and then around the rest of the den, we've just got some sleeping cubs. Uh, their mothers will be out possibly lying under the shade, having hunted at night or scavenged, and they'll come back probably during the course of the day, most likely this evening, in order to feed the youngsters. No, Cranky Panglin, I don't think so at all. Um, nature's own culling process. I don't think you could describe the migration as that at all. Um, uh, you know, I think the role of predators in the ecology of an area is to sort of keep numbers down. But remember that 60% of the death that happens during the migration has got nothing to do with the predators. It's just old age and disease and injury and that sort of thing. And I don't think the migration uh, necessarily contributes hugely to that. Yes, it does to a certain extent. But no, I don't think you could describe the migration as nature's natural culling process. 
a lack of resources is always going to be the most notable uh, kind of natural culling effect, if you like. You can still hear that whining noise. You can imagine why Waffles is not putting up with it. There we go. They're playing a little bit there. You can see she's getting a little bit irritated, and I suspect what she'll do is move away from the den. Those two cubs are den graduates. They're not actually resident here anymore. They're too big to go under the ground, so they don't live in the holes. And they're obviously just trying to hang around their mum. She's looking quite trim. We've seen her looking massively fat, and she's now looking over towards something that unfortunately is going to be a little bit big for her to eat, and that is a buffalo bull. He can obviously hear the predators. Beautiful stuff here. The sun is up, the hyenas are down. We're going to go and see if we can find an elephant on the river while you go back down south to Steve and the salt dick pride. The sun is indeed up. It is warming and I think these lionesses are maybe going to go find themselves some shade or maybe we'll be lucky with another hunt. Well, we have been spending a fair bit of time with lions out in the open, but the Mara River, with the crossings that happen every single year, is often a very, very important place for the lions to take advantage of the crossing herds. The banks of the Mara River are a rich hunting ground for resourceful predators. Some prides have learned that exhausted swimmers are easy pickings. They ply their trade in the cover of the riverine vegetation. <laughs> Ambitious youngsters learn through trial and error. while veterans like the famous musketeers, led by Scarface, relish the spoils of their coalition's dominance over the river hunting prides. For now, they wait for the arrival of the migration herds. When thousands of exhausted, unsuspecting travelers will make it across the water, only to face the bank hunting specialists of the Mara River. It's amazing how a river forms an entire ecosystem and how the lions take advantage of the fact that these wildebeest have to go across these rivers. It really is incredible to see it, how these prides form these territories around it, and particularly in the Mara. Here in the Serengeti, it's been very interesting to watch how there actually isn't that many lions near the river systems. Um, and I can't work out why. I mean, it's, theoretically, it's a very similar thing to what you see in the Mara, but it seems that a lot of the lions' territories here revolve more around the rocky areas than the river system itself, which surprises me a lot. I would have suspected that they would have sat on the river systems and as those wildebeest would pile out the river so that they would go after them. Oh, I think it's playtime now for our cubs. You can see the one has got a shoulder blade that it's now playing with, so if you're a little bit of a sensitive ear, maybe not the best time to look at the toys that the lions are playing with, but you can see that one has got a shoulder blade in its mouth and it is now picking it up and rolling it around everywhere the boys seem to be a little bit playful this morning they're definitely a lot more playful than um, the little female she's a little bit more shy what's also interesting is that there's another lioness that has joined since we've been sitting here oh, look at that isn't that cool lions at play is always one of the best things to watch they always make me laugh and there's a cute factor of note and this little fella is being as cute as you could possibly want where is that shoulder blade fun to play with him? There's grass everywhere, there's mud all over him. He's certainly not going to be in the good books with mom later because he's going to be typical boy and full of dirt after playtime. And look, he's stalking his sister and he goes bounding off into the thicket where she is. He was, seems to be the sort of more brazen of their grouping because he was the one that got up just now and went for a long walk, chased a jackal a little bit, then came back again and has bounded around all over the show. And it's the same individual that we had the other afternoon that came down the rock and then went trying to get back up and was slipping. Um, it's that same young male. So 
He seems to have a bit of character, that fella, and I quite like it when they do. There goes the little female. She's moving off on the right-hand side, going somewhere to go and investigate something. It's typical of cubs to be quite curious and want to go and try and see what's going on. Right, we're going to sit with these guys just because they're being a bundle of joy as they play around. And while we do that, let's send you across to David, who is again looking at a male ostrich. Yes, it's very true. I got an ostrich and when the migration is gone, we have seen lions even going for ostriches. When the resources become limited, lions will hunt almost anything they can catch or anything that's meaty. And we got a common ostrich here and this one is a male. We got two species of ostriches in Kenya. This one here that sometimes we call the Masi ostrich. And if you move further north of the equator, you're going to see another species that we call the Somali ostrich. My name is David and Bungay is still on the camera. And you're trying to wonder where the females of these ostriches would be because looking at him carefully, looking on his legs and neck, they look very pink. And that would, it would indicate that maybe he would be going to breeding uh, time. When they get that red or that pinkish on their necks and legs, it shows some breeding plumage in them. Remember, you're watching CTGN, World Wonderland Show, and you're coming you, to you live from the Masumara of Kenya. Ostriches will always eat seeds, like what you can see him there, doing some blades or fruits or flowers but I think for this particular one here he's just picking some seeds either from the red oat grass or some sort of different grass very easy to tell males from females because males are black and white and the females are always grayish brownish in color and definitely he must be a hungry ostrich well look around see whether you could see the females with him. In the meantime, we'll take you to Jamie, who got some lion cubs. Good morning, good morning. Look at this. This is the very first time you're seeing me, but this is why. Because these two, along with the rest of their pride, have been giving us a quite the run around. So there you go. From yesterday, you met the Inkawuma cubs on their way to that buffalo kill. Here they are again. A very good morning to you all. My name is Jamie and behind the camera is Craig. And we've had a very eventful morning, even though you haven't seen us because, oh, we're gonna, are we gonna pounce? We're gonna pounce, we're thinking about it. Because we actually found these little ones and we were about to start our walk and realized that we couldn't walk them without scaring them. <laughs> so we had to run back, fetch the vehicle and then find them again, but we've managed it right in the nick of time and look at these two little fluffy boys our uncle Humas have done so well and not only that i see that one of the other lionesses has got suckle marks as well which means that this pride is expanding by the weeks oh, apparently lots of you going ooh and ah i think the sighting actually speaks for itself to be honest Can you hear that? Tiny little cub cell. Oh, this is just so perfect. Linus has obviously decided it wasn't safe enough for the cubs around that buffalo kill so far south in their territory and they've shepherded them, shepherded them further to the north. Look at those claws. Oh, little voice. Now what you're looking at here, because they are two brothers, is a pairing that will last a lifetime. And if these two manage to make it to adulthood, they will be with each other the entire time.
Trish says, so much energy. I know. You know, the funny thing about this is the other day we were talking about the lioness taking them to that buffalo kill and how far she'd made them walk. And yet when the lionesses are tired and when they've settled down to rest, as Craig pointed out, the cubs are still going. They're still full of bounce. They're still running all over the show, showing their little teeth, sniffing everything and sneezing when the grass gets up their nose. Just like children or puppies or kittens, they are simply bundles of energy. This is so, so cool. I'm so happy we were able to find them again before the end of the show. And in case you need a reminder, this is you are watching CGTN's Wild Wonderland. <laughs> it is definitely a lion-themed morning, whether it's here in the Greater Kruger with uh, two bundles of joy, or up in the, the Masai Mara with lions cutting through swathes of grass. It is indeed. They have decided to lie down flat here in the grass between us and that herd at the back. Although it doesn't, do you see the tail flick? Although they do look quite close, the herds behind. And the camera gives away a bit of a different perception. It's actually quite far. But there they are, hidden in the red oat grass. I am really looking forward to seeing those cubs down in South Africa that Jamie's got. I was trapped knew they were around before I came up the side, but I've yet to lay my eyes on them. Very exciting times. But these zebras, I think, are aware that these lions are nearby. Lions seem to be having a little bit of a play with each other in the long grass. Sorry, we can't show you a better view than that. The tawny cats camouflaged in the tawny grass. Okay, well, it sounds like James has moved on from the North Clan and he's found a more aquatic animal. We have moved on from the North Clan. We're now on the river at Main North Crossing and it is here that the massive crocodiles are going to take their toll on the migration herds in probably a few weeks time when eventually the wildebeest arrive up here north. The hippos will watch as spectators. Sometimes they get a little bit involved and chase the crocodiles and chase the wildebeest and chase the zebra. But most of the time, they just watch in kind of, I suppose, gobsmacked amazement, the mayhem going on in the river in front of them. For now, they're very relaxed, and there's nothing quite as relaxing as spending a morning next to a gurgling African river with hippos grunting. Just a stunning way to end our morning. You're going to end your morning down in South Africa with Jamie Patterson and the Inkuhuma Little Cubs. With lion cubs, that's how you're going to end your morning. There might be nothing more relaxing than sitting next to a river, but there is nothing more heartwarming than watching wild lion cubs play in this way. And seeing them so comfortable, safe and secure, nestled in the heart of their pride, surrounded by the most protective force that nature has to offer. There are at least six lionesses here keeping an eye over these over these cubs. Uh, we've got a question coming from Lauren and Lauren who want to know, I might have got that wrong, who want to know, uh, might be Lauren and Robin, who want to know <laughs> uh, which lioness has the suckle marks. I haven't, I haven't actually seen, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm pretty certain that the lioness with the blind right eye, the purple-eyed lioness, has got a suckle marks or at least the last time I saw her, I was quite convinced she was pregnant, as well as Amber Eyes, I also thought she was pregnant. So two of our adult lionesses, our beloved lionesses, we could well be looking forward to some more lion cubs. And you never know what's gonna happen this afternoon. I don't really wanna take my eyes off these cubs for too long. There is a chance that there is a second set of cubs about to have their first introduction to the pride. The lioness with the suckle marks is left. So there's a chance that she might bring these cubs back for the afternoon to meet their older cousins. And this is the magic thing about lion prides. They are so synchronized that they even 
time, the birthing of their cubs around about at the same time. And that's, of course, because the cubs are not just raised by one lioness. They are raised by the pride as a whole. What a thing it must be. These tiny, fluffy, vulnerable creatures. And they certainly have the most impressive uh, protective system. I'm not even sure which one of these lionesses is their mother's. Oh, little voices calling to each other. Now, we are actually reaching the end of our CGTN Wild Wonderland show, and this afternoon is our finale. Can you believe it? What a spectacular week it has been. So join us on five at 5 p.m. East African time, and remember, keep an eye out on CGTN social media platforms. However, it's time for us to say goodbye. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been extra special this morning. We'll see you soon.